Welcome to Founders in Biotech. In this podcast, biotech entrepreneurs share their founders' journey and scientific achievements. I'm your host, Sergey Glinka. Today's guest is Alessio Chul. In the previous episode, we discussed with Alessio about his journey from academia to starting a biotech company. In this episode, the part two, we'll take a technical deep dive into the world of targeted protein degradation and protex, kind of the next level for small molecules. Here's a brief introduction about Alessio Chili. Alessio studied chemistry at the University of Florence in Italy. He completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge. Early on, Alessio worked with biophysical and structural analysis of protein ligand interactions, as well as fragment-based drug discovery. He worked during his career with Chris Abel, Tom Blundell, and Craig Cruz. Today, Alessio Chuli is a full professor and has his own group at the University of Dundee. Alessio also co-founded the biotech company Amphista Therapeutics. The company is focused on developing therapeutics leading to targeted protein degradation. Enjoy this episode and a technical deep dive into the world of protein. So let's 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 take a technical deep dive in in the world of Protex um, and like uh, first take a step back um, and talk about like those are bifunctional functional molecules and uh, maybe you can introduce our audience to to this concept of um, like Protex and bifunctional functional molecules. Absolutely. So. Um... Uh, so conventional drugs typically uh, inhibit or block a target. So you have your target protein or, or its its functional site. It could be a catalytic domain or it could be a, a protein-protein interaction site or it could be a receptor. And typically you, you then uh, have to rely on finding a, a, a ligand that binds uh, to this site and is able to block it. And for that, you need to achieve and maintain sufficient level of a drug uh, to, to do that so that you can block, you know, 99, 99% of the, of the molecules in the cell. Um, and it needs to be a functional site uh, uh, in order to do that. And the problem is that not all proteins are susceptible to that. It's not always easy to develop molecules that are, enable you to do that. And actually, most proteins actually are, are multifunctional, multi-domain, or have lots of different activities or interactions. And so blocking uh, or inhibiting a single interaction or activity may not be sufficient. Um, and it's very different, actually, from how we validate proteins and genes uh, and they're relevant to disease, which is typically we, we remove that gene or that protein from the cell. Uh, and so, uh, so the idea with Protex and the greatest more generally is um, how about doing exactly that instead? How about having a molecule that could uh, degrade that protein, remove it very quickly from inside the cell? Um, and, and achieve exactly that. And so, so the idea, is, therefore, uh, is to then uh, have a binder to the, the, your, your protein, but at the other end, have a, a binder to a different protein, an E3 ligase, uh, so that now the, that's why it's called bifunctional molecule. It's got two heads. And so the individually, the molecule can bind uh, to those two proteins separately. And uh, and this is uh, the key discovery that uh, we made, uh, the development of that VHL ligand that I was mentioning, one of these E3 ligase, and developing this ligand uh, in such a way that it would be more drug-like, and we use fragment-based approach. So that was the link with the with the, the expertise mm -hmm. and the know-how uh, and my background and training in fragment-based approach. So we started with the nat natural fragment, hydroxyproline, which is the, the amino acid... Uh, um, moiety that re gets recognized by the HL in its natural substrate and build around that uh, left-hand side, right-hand side, atom by atom to then make a m much more drug-like molecule, non-peptidic. And that was a key discovery that enabled the field because the early molecules were peptidic in nature and peptides don't make good drugs. And so that was a key limitation. And so the two heads joined by the linker. And so, um, and now these two proteins can then be brought together and uh, and that leads triggers to ubiquitination and degradation, and uh, and that's where you know the field uh, uh, had not shown that 
these molecules could work like we, we could have dreamed of. And then in 2015, my lab and uh, Craig's lab and, uh, and Jay Bradner's lab independently demonstrated that by using the VHL ligand, uh, as well as using another ligand for a different E3 ligase called Cerebron, that then the, in the field had been shown to, to work by binding to that ligase, and uh, and we saw structures, uh, lots of structures for our VHL ligand, another group, Nico Thomas lab, at the, and also uh, Phil Chamberlain and Celgene showed soul structures of uh, of, of that uh, uh, small molecule binding to Cerebron. Now the field had two ligases with two different ligands. And in those papers, we were able to show that these two ligases can be hijacked. Uh, using protact like molecules, uh, protact molecules, bifunctional molecules, two different sets of targets. And so we had, you know, we showed scope and we showed that those molecules were remarkably active, was highly selective in cells and were also active uh, in, in a mouse model. And so I think that was really the prime time for the field. Yeah. Yeah. So those are great, great works. I, I must admit, I have read all of them. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of, like uh, like drug discovery is already hard, uh, but like this this concept um, brings a totally new dimension. So so um, talking about like drug discovery is hard in to identify s molecules that that are selective, that are potent, uh, and uh, there are rules that the industry follows. But what are what are the the challenges in, in designing those small molecules um, as protags. Yes. So, so you know, the, the, the first ever challenge was to, to have a good E3 ligase ligand, and that took years to solve. Uh, but once we had those two good ligands in hand, then we realized, okay, we can now design um, good proteins. We can make linkers to good ligands and degrade proteins. Uh, but then, you know, so the way I see this is the, the initial challenges. We, we didn't know if we could degrade proteins before 2015. I think in 2015, mm -hmm. we showed, yes, we can degrade proteins. Uh, but then, you know, then the question became, what, uh, what could we degrade? Could we degrade all proteins, right? And how, how easy it is to degrade proteins? And, and then we've learned a lot, a lot along the way. Uh, but already since the early study, we made a very important learning and understanding. And that was that we can, we could, we could, by turning an inhibitor into a degrader, we can now um, have much more selective molecules. We can have molecules that could discriminate between very similar protein much more easily and much in a remarkable fashion that was just not possible to do with the individual inhibitor. And now we understand more uh, why that is. Um, and, uh, and, and the key discovery for us was to solve the first ever ternary complex crystal structure of that mm -hmm. protac bound simultaneously to both the ligase, the HL in our case, and the target protein, the bromo domain of BRD4 in that case, uh, which was really the first starting point, the first glimpse that could illuminate how this protac could work in action. And, and where that potential specificity and selectivity could come from. And we now really understand it because actually this ternary complex that forms, it isn't just enough to be in proximity. The, the, the two proteins are brought so closely together that they can form very, very tight protein-protein interactions, right? And now these are protein-protein interactions that instead of being disrupted, they don't get formed in the first instance. These two proteins don't interact on their own in the absence without the protac, but with the protac that bridges and bring them close enough in proximity, now they can form this protein-protein interaction. Now they can, now they, there can be a series of interactions that can mm. be stabilized in this complex. And now we're engaging with regions of the protein that are much less conserved. And so now, even though we are recruiting uh, two or three or more similar protein that the inhibitor would block equally mm. and hence be non-selective, uh, we form different types of complexes and uh, and some of these complexes get degraded faster and easier and at lower concentration so so we we build a, a differentiation and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a window of selectivity which we were able to show with our with our degrader so that was really a, a really fundamental insight and understanding about one of the key advantages that now we and others see over and over again in the field that degraders have a, an exquisite selectivity over and above 
uh, what you can achieve. And because it's a new modality and a new mechanism that go via the ternary complex, we don't have to actually saturate and fully occupy the target. And so, so we achieve mm -hmm. kinetic selectivity as well, uh, a substoichiometric concentration. These are really fundamental insights and understanding. Uh, and of course, uh, there are still challenges about how we design these molecules. These molecules are larger, and uh, it's not always straightforward that we can find one molecule immediately. Just this first molecule we make will, will be like that. We often have to make a few handful of molecules or tens of molecules, sometimes hundreds of molecules before we can actually get a molecule that works really well. And, and that is because it's such a complex mechanism. The protac has got to go inside the cell, bind the two proteins individually, then bring them together uh, in the right way. So then ubiquitination has to happen, then it has to degrade, and then the protein can be resynthesized. And so the protac has to, to, be, to be very efficient at catching that. And so there could be things that can go wrong at any of, of such steps. So, so there's still challenges to actually design and finding yeah. that good molecule. Yeah. So in term, like there's a terminology. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, like the 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 part of the protect uh, that addresses uh, the three ligase is the recruiter, and the uh, that uh, binding to the protect interest is the warhead. So. Um, with I think like like I reflecting um, uh, the the publication, uh, one of your publications, and it seems like and from what you're saying is that structure biology and also um, fragment based drug discovery have really like combining those um, in in terms of proximity, uh, bringing proteins together by this molecular glues, a very very popular term. Um, that that those key um, um, key tech, like those technologies were key technologies for the design of those molecules. Absolutely, and protac protax uh, are indeed molecular glues or can be very good glues. And indeed, the protein, the protac MZ1 that we saw the structure of, is a glue because it's cooperative. It it enhances the affinity uh, uh, at any stages in the process, such that uh, you know the, the the whole is more than the sum of the part. And so that gluing uh, yeah. is is what makes it uh, a really good uh, degrader, right? And so, so absolutely. And uh, I mean, if you think about how free ligases work, even on their native substrate, they have to grab to them, they have to bind to them. There always is an element of substrate recognition, protein-protein interaction, so that that substrates get recruited there and sit there for long enough in the right orientation, so that it can get those ubiquity. And so, what we're doing with a protax or molecular glue, you know, whatever terms you want to use, or whether it's mm -hmm. two-headed with the linker or whether it's actually a molecule that actually maybe bind to only one of these protein and the other one then gets stabilized on top of it. And, and, uh, and there's, there's molecules that work like that as well. And there's nuances, but essentially they work the same way. Is what they do is they, they now recruit proteins that wouldn't normally uh, sit uh, into, on top of that ligase for long enough and would not normally be recruited, would not normally be degraded, ubiquitous and degraded. And so that's how these molecules work. Uh, and like, um, there is a lot of, I have to ask this question. There's a lot of, um, a lot of methods uh, published in drug discovery, which cover machine learning, et cetera. And I, I don't want to comment on, on the claims, uh, but there are approaches that claim that um, there is something that is called linkerology, how you link those uh, those two parts of the molecules. And do you like? What's your opinion? On, will geometric deep learning solve the challenge once you have kind of you know uh, you know the proteins, you know potentially what kind of uh, what kind of um, molecules can can bind to separately, and then. Uh, like, will will we have in future some kind of platform that predicts that? Uh, what is the right, right linker? What is the right orientation of the protein? Yes, I think it's very exciting times. Uh, uh, these are very powerful um, methods. They're, they're very powerful algorithms. We are seeing that when applied appropriately into areas where the you know there's a there's a, a tangible problem uh, where we can have a workable solution such as for example the prediction of uh, of uh, protein structures um 
uh, they, they can be remarkably powerful. We've seen this with, with, uh, with the advances of AlphaFold, for example. Uh, and I think it's really exciting times for that field of, uh, of uh, you know, deep learning and, uh, and neural networks and machine learning. Uh, I, I am not an expert myself. I don't claim to be. But when I speak to experts, I think I've been convinced that, that the power of that of that, okay. of, of that methodology, um, but I think it's very early days uh, in terms of how we can uh, um, it can be a pri you know a priori prospectively applied to a field like protac because it's such a complex um, area um, and there's um, not enough uh, you know data or usable data. data. And uh, and it's actually a very complex problem because you have two proteins that don't interact. And you're bringing them together with a very flexible molecule in all sorts of potential ways, and and then uh, there could be there could be only one uh, that 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 is uh, what you need to get to, and uh, different. And what we see, right? And we've learned this over and over again. We've published this over and over again. For the same ligase and the same target, you can make pro very similar protac molecule, but some that don't degrade at all. They look like inactive some that degrade a bit slowly and partially and some that degrade really fast and really, really importantly and very, very, very uh, to completion. And and so clearly that's something about the chemistry, how we bring these two together. And, uh, you know, will we be able to predict all of that uh, uh, very strongly? Potentially, yes, but we're clearly not there yet. Okay. Yeah. But let's let's stay with chemistry and flexible flexible molecules. So there is the the Lipinski rule of five that the industry is stuck with, but like proteins are, are, are larger. Uh, and then there is a beyond the rule of five. How has the field actually emerged? Like from like, we are still in the technical deep dive. So what has happened in, in the last years in, in this field? Yes, I think I think the I think the field of medicinal chemistry has come to terms to recognize that uh, if we want to go after challenging targets, we need to challenge our conventions and our limitations and our um, conventional wisdoms and uh, and rules. We have to break rules because uh, these are not rules; they're just like guide guidelines, and they and they have all, all sorts of caveats, limitations, and uh, and limited area of applicability. So, you know, the rule of five is, has been a way of uh, predicting the probability of uh, that a molecule might exhibit oral bioavailability or not, but it doesn't mean that if it, if you have a molecule that doesn't meet that, it's not going to, oral bio, to be orally bioavailable. And we've learned this over and over and over again. I mean, macrocycles uh, break the rule of five, protax break the rule of five. There are many other types of molecules that even when they break the rule of five, they can have amazing pharmacokinetic properties and, and they can be orally bioavailable. And so I think the field has kept surprising us. We just recently published, uh, disclosed a molecule where we which is a, a protac like molecule that breaks the rule of five and um, and is uh, we can detect uh, that molecule in the brain of the mouse and uh, you look at wow. it and you would okay. and you would say I you would never check say, this out. you would never say that it is the impenetrant. so so I think we need to keep an open mind and I, I think uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 there's going to be case by case, uh, um, and uh, you know molecules are very complex, and uh, and uh, and the more complex are the molecules, the more the more exceptions to the rules uh, there are. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the hint for the, the new public. I need to check this out. Um, it breaks definitely some 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 paradigms, um, uh, but um, like the the whole modality that we're talking about is completely new to. And it reminds me, like um, uh, the the Reed Hoffman founder of LinkedIn. He, it, it sounds like like you. It's already an entrepreneurial journey that uh, that you are on, um, and started early on. That, that he's saying when you uh, entrepreneurship is like jumping off um, uh, off a plane and and building the solution how to land um, something like that. So it seems like we see is this the next big thing in 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 in, in this development of therapeutics. I mean, there are publications that take this chimera uh, idea, a chimeric idea, and uh, abstract it. There are light tags, dub tags, ribo tags. Uh, there, there are like more tags than pro tags. Like from the high level, we jump out, like we jump 
out of the plane from a high level perspective um what is happening is this the next big thing in 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 designing therapeutics uh, for, for sure uh we are seeing a uh, exciting times in the development of our thinking and thinking about um new modalities um uh, but actually, the way we think about how a, a drug not only looks like, but actually how it works. And so, um, mm. you know, so far we've been limited ourselves to thinking about a one-on-one -on -one scenario of, a, of a one drug to one target, uh, blocking that target as a, as, a, as a way of that drug working. Whereas what we're seeing now is we're seeing more multi-specific uh, drugs that bring proteins together, bring one protein together to another protein, or brings, you know, free parts together, like, we, you know, we, we, we disclosed uh, this new concept of the trivalent protax with three heads, uh, mm -hmm. that's better than two, uh, because it now engages a target at two different sites and it grabs the target better. Uh, to the ligase, but you you know you could extend that uh, even further, um, and just so you bring in proteins into proximity, if you wish, or um, into in, together into complexes, and I think that this is now taking us to the next level, a new modality and new new ways of thinking about how a drug looks like, but also how a drug works because. Yeah. This, this is going to be uh, an approach that allows us not just to block that target on one side, mm -hmm. but to get that target to do new things. In the case of protaxis, mm -hmm. we degrade that target. Yeah. But there could be other, other functional responses onto that target. And I think there's a lot of excitement to, to develop that. But yeah. you know, other, other modalities are being thought of, developed, uh, designed, and, uh, and investigated. But, uh, but clearly, pro, you know, Protex is a front runner in the clinic, um, and in, in in the in the way you know, in the way in which it's approaching uh, uh, making medicines that matters to patients. Thanks for being with us on the Founders in Biotech podcast. I hope you enjoyed the technical deep dive into targeted protein degradation in Protex. Do you want to raise awareness of cutting edge science, emerging technologies, and innovation? Please do reach out to us and visit foundersinbiotech.com. We'd like to thank CSL Bearing for supporting this initiative. See you in the next episode.